hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll work all right. So uh, hello, my name is Harry Kalodner. I'm a PhD student from Princeton University, and I'm here to talk today to talk about the instability of Bitcoin without the block reward. Uh, this is a this is a joint work between myself, Miles Carlston, Matt Weinberg, and my advisor, Arvind Narayanan. So, as many of you know, in Bitcoin, miners are rewarded for successfully mining blocks by being paid with a block award. However, this reward is scheduled to go down over time, being cut in half every four years. And the, and the, uh, the goal of the currency when it was designed was to have that reward eventually be replaced entirely by fees uh, transaction fees paid to miners by users of the system. And so in this work, we were inspired to look at the long-term stability of the Bitcoin protocol after the block award has completely disappeared. So, um, <laughs> some minor technical difficulties. both of them multiple times, and neither of them is, uh... Yeah, can you, uh, I, I actually have a USB stick with it, oh. also. Perfect. <laughs> second, okay. We'll, uh, continue again in a second. Yeah. See, now it's gonna work. Oh, it was about 32. Can you just um, turn on the resolution to um, 124 by 7? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so back to the laptop. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, my, if that might work. Actually, would also try to turn on the resolution to um, N60. Yep. All right, so we should be good now, hopefully. Uh, sorry about the delay, but uh, I'll just continue on. So, so as I was saying, we wanted to, for this work, we wanted to investigate the stabil long-term stability of Bitcoin when the block award has diminished to zero and transaction fees instead fund the mining of blocks. And uh, I'll explain how we did that, and, uh, but I want to start by just looking at what we found. Uh, so... We found that projectors are not very useful. So we found another, a number of kind of key results about the behavior of the, uh, the, the, strate the strategic behavior of the ecosystem uh, in this situation. So rational miners who are profit incentivized and only seek to optimize their overall earnings will deviate from the standard behavior of always mining on the longest chain and on the first seen block um, of, a given, uh, of a given length. And this will cause a lot of very negative effects. 
Orphan block rates will increase greatly, which will lead to lowered security um, and seriously impact the ability of anyone to use Bitcoin. We also found a very interesting effect, which is that some strategies that involve purposefully forking the blockchain will create a bound on transaction throughput, even when the if the block size were unlimited. And I want to also tell you a little bit about the bigger picture of, of why this talk is interesting and why it's important. So years after the release of Bitcoin, we still don't really have a nice full model of the system. And a lot of this has to do because of it, with the fact that it's just very complicated and very difficult to model successfully. And this is a real problem. Um, and it's a problem because Bitcoin very precisely relies on incentive mechanisms for all of the security properties it provides. And we know Bitcoin works if everyone is behaving honestly, but that doesn't mean that everyone's behaving rationally. And we see that divide is very important here. And the cryptocurrency community has not made full enough use of the theory and, 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 and uh, tools of mechanism design. And the reliance on intuition for the effects of various properties of cryptocurrencies leads to some pretty serious problems, as we see in this paper. Uh, and just kind of say why, to, to show you that this is a field that is worth investigating and that people are spending time on and that we need people, even more people to, to work on. There's a, already a number of papers that have attempted to look at particular deviations in strategies. And in this paper, we look in a new setting and we try to create a wider, more general framework for studying these systems. So kind of the direct contributions of our work. So first of all, I'd like to present this work as an advanced warning against problems that are coming in Bitcoin's future. That when the block award decreases, as it's scheduled to do every four years, we will eventually reach the point where Bitcoin is no longer operating successfully. We provide a rig rigorous theoretical framework for performing this analysis. Along with that, we provide a versatile mining simulator, which enables us, which is, uh, which is open source and freely available, which enables us to test the effects of various strategies, and, as well as in, uh, how they operate in a variety of different network parameters. And we look at all of this as a way to provide lessons for the design of future cryptocurrencies. So now just to give you a little bit of background for those of you who don't understand all the terminology I've used so far. Um, so Bitcoin transactions are, occur when one user wants to send Bitcoin to another user and they're broadcast to the network and put on a global data structure called the blockchain. And Bitcoin users pay transaction fees in order to buy space for their transaction. And they pay this transaction fee to the Bitcoin miner. Now the miner assembles a series of transactions into a block and, and performs a computationally intensive task in order to put that block onto the blockchain. And they're rewarded for the amount of effort that they've put in by a block reward, which is just a flat amount rewarded for the block, along with transaction fees, which are paid by the users to the miner. Now, we don't just have one miner, we have multiple miners. And so these multiple miners all compete to see who can solve the cryptographic puzzle, which is what they need to solve, first in order to get their block on the chain. Now, in an optimal setting, all the miners would always just build on top of whatever the latest block that's been found, and everything would go along with just a simple list. However, this doesn't always happen. And forks can occur in the blockchain. So let's say we have a malicious miner who creates a double spend block, and this is just one example of something that could cause a fork. Now, they've created a valid block here and broadcast it to the network. However, or not valid, but they've created a block and broadcast it to the network. However, other miners are gonna to refuse to mine on that block and instead mine a new block parallel to it in the blockchain. Now, when that happens, we have two blocks of the same length and miners need to decide which they're going to mine on. Now, in this situation, they're going to mine on the new block because it doesn't include any double spends. And what'll happen to the old block is that the miner who mined it, who still put in all of this effort, will lose the block award and lose the transaction fees, and their block will be orphaned and no longer contribute to the security of the network. So one important 
piece of information before I kind of go into the more interesting results is a little bit about our model. So in Bitcoin, blocks arrive following an exponential distribution, which means that the time between blocks is fairly variable. Now, when there's a large block reward, blocks still have approximately the same value since the block reward isn't affected by how quickly blocks arrive. However, transaction fees are, and in our paper we, we model transaction fees as arriving at a constant rate, which means that the amount of value in a block will be very variable depending on how long it takes to find that block. And we call, and transac the, the constant arrival of transaction fees is a simplifying assumption for an even more complex system in Bitcoin today where transactions arrive at varying intervals and with varying sizes. And so results we show in this model apply even more greatly to the more complex models. So as I was saying, the transaction right now, so as, right now, the block rewards are large enough that these transaction fees are inconsequential. And so minor strategy isn't really affected by them. But now we're gonna look at how the strategies change in a model where the block reward is small and the vast majority of Bitcoin allotted to the, mod, to the miner comes from the, block, from the transaction fees. So I'm gonna go through a couple deviant strategies that arise in these scenarios. Now, our first strategy is, uh, violates the property that miners will mine on the first block they see of a given height. Now, Normal miners would mine using that strategy on branch A of the blockchain. Here we have a fork represented by blocks of size 15 and 10 branching off. A normal miner saw 15 block, the block with 15 transactions in it first, and so they'll just start mining on top of it. However, there are only five transactions available to be included in the block they're mining, since it hasn't been very long after the block was generated, and thus there isn't very much money to be earned from mining that block. Therefore, when a miner sees a new block mined with 10 transactions in it arise at a slightly later point, they're incentivized to instead mine on top of that block since there are many more transactions available since the block of 10 did not include five of the transactions that were included in the previous block. And so we can see here that we have a distinct incentive to deviate from the standard protocol. Mining on the longest chain is not always rational when block rewards are dwarfed by transaction fees. And this violates an important property and leads to more egregious violations of the protocol that I'll talk about now. So here's our second deviant strategy. And now this is, this is where it gets bad because this is where we look at purposeful forks being caused. Now here we have a situation where there are there's been a block with seven transactions and a block with 15 transactions, and now there are five new transactions that haven't yet been published to the blockchain. Now, a miner could mine on top of that block of 15, including their five transactions, which would earn them a fairly small amount, but they have another option. If they just ignore the existence of that block of 15 transactions, they could instead fork the blockchain and be able to choose from 20 transactions to include in the blockchain. Now, a rational miner would rather mine a block of 20 transactions than a block of five transactions if they think they could get it in the blockchain, since clearly that's a large amount more earnings for that miner. So, but the miner, so the miner instead could be, will be incentivized to mine a block parallel to that block of 15, perhaps mining a block with 10 transactions in it. And then all miners using the deviant strategy I discussed in the previous slide will switch over to mining on their block making it much more likely that their block will end up in the main chain, and the original honestly mined block will become orphaned. And this, this orphaning of the block is, is very troubling, since we've now seen that it's rational to not always just try to mine on the longest chain if you're trying to maximize your profits. And so what this shows is that we're gonna have a real breakdown in security, because the orphan rate will increase massively when rather than orphan blocks being an, an accidental effect of network latency, they, be, they instead become a real thing even in zero network latency situations, which is where we did most of our uh, analysis. 
And so looking at how miners, those were just a couple examples of strategies, but looking at how miners really try to optimize their rewards in this model, they have two fairly contradictory points that they're trying to balance. They want to have each block include the maximum amount of value possible, and, but they also want to stop or disincentivize other miners from forking under them and orphaning their block. And so strategies in this scheme try to accomplish both of those goals. So now I want to talk about how we actually did this, how we, how we went from kind of just an intuitive understanding of these strategies to an actual fully formed paper. So we began with just an intuitive model of a strategy, and this is using essentially deviant strategy two I discussed earlier, where a miner at any given point is going to decide whether they want to mine on the head of the chain or whether they want to fork. And so we take that strategy and we encode it into our game theoretic model of Bitcoin. We create a formal description of the strategy, which can be reasoned about and, pro and have theorems proved on. Next, we take, that, we take that strategy and we encode it for use in our C++ simulator. Now, we've attempted to make this simulator as close to possible as our theoretic language in order to enable as vast an audience of users to experiment with, as, experiment with it as possible. And so the code is essentially directly equivalent. And the idea being that the bridge from starting with kind of just a description to being able to fully simulate it is minimized. So now I want to talk about what sort of kind of powerful things we were able to do with this combination by using our simulator to simulate, block coin, um, simulate Bitcoin mining as well as our theoretical model in order to prove, uh, in order to prove results. So in our paper, we present a number of various things we were able to prove using our full model, using our model of Bitcoin. One very important one and very interesting one is that if, even if up to 66% of miners remain non-rational, remain using the default Bitcoin mining strategy. So most miners do not make use of any of these tools. It's still profitable to use forking strategies. And so even if a very limited number of miners are actually interested in deviating, they will and it'll still cause substantial orphaning problems. However, our simulation, our, our theoretical model was only able to predict that 66% point. And so we then moved over to our simulator and wanted to actually test how strategies would develop for varying quantities of miners remaining default. And so the chart over on the left of the screen, you can see we explore for a given percentage of miners remaining default, which sort of strategies out of a limited set that we run, that we tested, are beneficial. And so less and less aggressive forking is profitable as miners, um, as more mi and more miners remain default, which is an intuitive result, but which we can put concrete numbers on via our simulation. One other interesting area where we were able to both combine and extend theoretical results using simulation is in predicting equilibrium strategies. So in our paper, we present an equilibrium strategy called Lampert, called Lampert function forking. Um, the details of that are not important. You can check it out in the paper if you're interested. Um, but the important result is that an equilibrium exists where all miners use this Lambert function fork strategy. And this induces a growing backlog of transactions. And so we have a bound, we are, so we're bounding the size of blocks purely through strategic choices made by miners. Now, the paper only proves this result in the case where all miners begin as Lambert function forks. No miner can be incentivized to deviate. However, using simulation, we proved that even if 0.001% of miners start, as, start with this strategy, it will eventually spread to all miners and dominate the, and, do, and dominate and move to 100%. And so we were able to extend the solution by showing that this is an extremely strong equilibrium point rather than a weak one. So the main results of the paper, what I want you to know about this paper, 
Forking is profitable with up to two-thirds of all mining power using the default strategy. And this shows that this is going to happen even if most miners don't pay any attention to this work. Rational strategies lead to a growing backlog of transactions due to forking causing limited block sizes. And a further result in our paper that we show, although I didn't get a chance to talk about it in this talk, is that selfish mining is even more powerful when transaction fees dominate. And it's actually able to be strictly better than rational mining um, under any arbitrary set of, uh, any, uh, any arbitrary hash power. Let's see if we come back. So takeaways for kind of general, generally about cryptocurrencies. Without changes to Bitcoin's functionality, security may break down in the long term. And so this is something we need to start thinking about now and confronting. And future cryptocurrencies may benefit from just including a block reward and not having it diminish, since all of these effects are caused by this diminishing block reward. And we'd like, our simulator is uh, available online, and we'd like researchers to use it to predict results of new mining strategies or, or various parameter choice changes in order to see if we can find a really stable system that we can use. Now, broader lessons to take away from this work, kind of looking beyond just Bitcoin or just cryptocurrencies, is that broadly, intuitively designed incentive systems are just impossible to get right. You really need a theoretical framework and modeling in order to properly design a complex system such as this. And mechanism design theory can be used to make powerful predictions in these systems in order to see how their behavior will work. Additionally, simulations can be a very powerful tool in order to verify and extend theoretical results efficiently. So thank you for listening. We have, uh, if any of you are interested, the URL for our mining simulator, and uh, happy to take any questions. Hey, would this be solved if every two weeks in Bitcoin we not only calculate a hardness level, but also a max transaction per block? so that it's not that easy to create a block with a huge transaction. Wait, sorry, I don't think I completely understand if, the question. If uh, every a period of time in Bitcoin, there was a, a number calculated that said that the maximum transaction that one block has is X, so you can't get higher than that if you set mm -hmm. this mine. Would this help solving your problem? Um, not, I mean, not really. I mean, so it's, it's kind of any particular change to the protocol is pretty difficult to analyze directly and because of all the massive number of different effects it can have. And that's actually one of the major points of this work is that kind of it doesn't work to just kind of suggest something. I mean, it might very well, I mean, any kind of particular solution might very well work. But the point is that the system is so dynamic and complex that you really need to fully understand it in order to be able to, to do anything. And so kind of most of the, the focus of this paper is not on kind of ex entirely on this particular problem as much as kind of the broader um, area. I mean, what, what we do know is that kind of things like maximum block sizes don't really solve the problem since you can still have variable transaction fees. Um, and kind of you can't, and putting limits on transaction fees doesn't really work because that affects the ability to have higher priority transactions take precedence over lower priority transactions. Thanks. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, so the Bitcoin community has already had a couple of days to react to this. And like, like usual, when, um, when a paper comes out and is announced, <laughs> the, the reactions are fast and furious. And so I, I just wondered if you, if you could summarize any of the reactions that you've gotten so far, if they make any interesting counterpoints, and if you have any reactions to those. Um, I, haven't had a, a, I haven't had much of a chance to, uh, to look at a lot of it yet. I mean, I know um, that one of the um, proposals uh, looked at examines uh, sharing transaction fees between the miner that mines a block and the miner who mines on top of that block as a way to incentivize miners to not use the strategy. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, I know additionally as related work, Bitcoin NG uses, uh, uses a technique like that. 
it, it very well, I, I'd be, I'm definitely, uh, I mean, as future work for this talk, I'd definitely be very interested. And certainly if anybody wanted to offer a pull request in expanding our simulator to, to um, use, uh, to tr attempt one of those uh, solutions. Would you, would you say that it's a prudent choice then to, I guess, have uh, a block reward? If you had a cryptocurrency with a block reward that just kept going, then, then that, that's maybe the easiest way to, yeah. to get the equilibrium proof? Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the simplest solution. There might be more complex ones, and I know there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of people in the cryptocurrency community who are against a, a permanent block reward because it causes a permanent inflation. Um, but that's just kind of the, the most trivial way of causing this not to happen. Cool, thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. I think like work like this that understands the systems better is very important. Um, besides game theory, have you thought about maybe using reinforcement learning or other techniques in order to achieve maybe the same results? Right, so our, our simulator itself actually uses uh, no regret learning in order to derive uh, equilibrium conditions uh, for, for what strategies will be used. And so the, uh, the stack plot I showed um, Back here, each uh, each point on that was actually an equilibrium condition under uh, under no regret learning. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other? Uh... Two questions. First question: What is the uh, labels for these axes? Um, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> So the bottom is percentage of miners that are remaining using the default mining protocol, so the non-rational miners. And the top is, um, the left is uh, the percentage of miners who are using a given strategy. And this is a stack plot, so it always adds up to one. Um, when you say in the long run, uh, how, long is, how long is that before you would expect these things to come about? And so when should we start? shorting <laughs> Right, yeah. No, great question. Um, so we don't have some, we don't have like very deep results on this, but just kind of some preliminary, I've done some preliminary work looking at this. So the block reward halves every two years. So it's currently at 12.5. In eight years, it'll be down to 3.125. And our simulations show that if each block additionally includes about 10 Bitcoins worth of uh, transaction fees, then these strategies will, will uh, be part of the equilibrium uh, optimal mining strategy. So kind of using fairly practical numbers, this, this becomes a, a pretty serious problem at that point. Cool. Thanks for listening. Okay, let's move on to the uh, second paper, Proof of